Today, I continue the process of where we we're discussing the genesis of all mankind's problems, the beginning of all mankind's problems. I talk, started on it last week, and I'm hoping that today I can begin to dig a little deeper so that you can get a better understanding. Genesis 3, for everyone that has not heard me say this, is a chapter of the Bible that defines everything about man. It defines who we are, where we're going, or where we have the potential to go. It tells the story of God's relationship to man. And we learn that it is the story of all mankind because every human life is like Adam in the garden. And we must make a choice to honor or dishonor God. That's a key point. Every life is like Adam. You get up in the morning, you're going to make a choice this day. Am I going to honor God or am I going to dishonor God? I will honor him by obeying him and I will dishonor him by disobeying him. And every day is a choice you have to make. Now, I had someone ask me the other day, said, well, why does he always go back to Genesis? Why does he go back to the first books of the Bible? Because I'm going to tell you something. Genesis explains everything. Genesis means beginnings. Now look, and you can challenge me all you want on this, but it ain't going to change. Genesis is how God set things up, and the way he set them up, they still remain that way today. Whatever he said do in Genesis is still the same. Nothing changes. There's an order in the universe, and you find that order in the very beginning with the book of Genesis. But I also want you to know when we look in the third chapter, we see the, the way man deals with God. You're going to see, as I go through this story today, you're going to see that God has always given man choice. He's given man a choice as to whether he's going to follow him or not. Adam and Eve were given a choice. The choice, remember, the choice of all the trees in the garden or the choice to go against God and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve chose the wrong choice, the wrong door, and they lost. And as a result, there were certain things that happened. There were consequences. And the consequences of Adam and Eve's choice was that they were cast out of the garden. That's the whole story of man. You and I, when we get up every day, we're making choices as to whether we're going to honor God or whether we're going to disobey God. And as a result of those choices, if we dishonor and disobey God, the thing that happened with Adam and Eve is going to happen to us. And so therefore, we have to recognize Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. The same thing, God has put us in this position here to make a choice. If we go against him, then we will be cast out from his presence. You'll find that Adam and Eve hid from the presence of God, like many of us do, when we know where the Word of God is, we refuse to go where the Word of God is because we want to hide from the presence of God that He is His Word. And if we keep hiding from God, the time will come when God will say, you've hid from me long enough. Now I know what your choice is. You don't want to be around me, so depart from me. Adam and Eve made a choice that they wanted to choose the things of the world, and God said, I'm going to put you out. But also God gave them hope. He said when he spoke to the serpent, he said that the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, that there would be enmity between them, and that the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel yes, of his seed, the seed that comes from her, but yet the seed that comes from her would crush the serpent's head, thereby telling us about Jesus Christ. So even in Genesis, the third chapter, we see the first revelation of Jesus coming into the world, and we see that Jesus was going to be the one that's going to defeat the works of the devil. All of that's seen in Genesis 3. Now, I told you last week to go read the chapter. I pray that most of you all have read it. Let me see the hands of those who've read it. Don't lie, it's Sunday morning. All right, okay, I got a few hands. I'm going to read it anyway for those of you who did not read it. But I'm here to tell you there's revelation there and there's a blessing for you if you just do what I tell you to do. God's got something to say to you. 
And you'll find out a lot of times that the man of God would tell the people to do something for everyone that would do what God told the man of God to tell the people when they do it, there would be the blessing. And you can choose to ignore me if you want, but you ought to know me by now. I am not bringing you a whole lot of bag of wind. I'm bringing you the truth. And I suggest to you, when I tell you to do a simple thing like read God's word, you ought to do it. Especially when I'm on telling you to read one chapter. You can do this. You can do it. But God tells us things from Genesis. And I'm going to show you something. In Isaiah 46, 9, God tells us in the beginning what the end is going to be. So Genesis 3 tells us what the end is going to be for all of us who reject God. Here's what he says in Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things of old. Remember the former things. Of, learn from me, he's saying. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Look what he says in verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. What is the book of Genesis? The beginning. God has declared where things are going to be in the book of Genesis. And in the third chapter, he lets you know if you rebel against him what your end is going to be. From the very beginning. There's no question about this. You're going to see that when Adam and Eve make a choice, they're going to face a judgment. And you're going to find out when they're judged, God says to them, have you eaten of the tree I commanded you not to eat? In other words, I'm going to judge you by the words I spoke to you. You and I have to understand whether we are knowledgeable or ignorant of God's word, we are still going to be judged by God's word. Therein is the reason I constantly keep giving you God's word so that when you stand at the day of judgment, you will not be ignorant of what God said. And I will tell you, there are pastors that will lie to you. I will tell you, there are notable people that will mislead you because the serpent is the one that's leading them. I will say very confidently, I will never speak a word to you that I know is a word that is to deceive you or to cause you to do what I want you to do. I have paid the price in the past only on one time of lying on God, and I will never lie on him again. Only one time, and I wasn't in the ministry at that time. I was something I wanted to get away with, and so I was going to tell a lie on God. But I ain't going to never do that again. Never do that again. I ain't going to tell you what it was either, but I ain't going to never. But here's the point. God declares the end from the beginning. And he says, from ancient times, things that are not yet done. I'm going to tell you about it, saying, my counsel shall stand. In other words, God says, whatever I say and whatever I tell you, it's the final authority. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not change. It's still going to be here. And he said, and I will do all my pleasure. God says, I'll do what I want and ain't nobody else. I don't care how many of y'all vote me down. I'm still going to be God. And what we see in Genesis, the third chapter, we also see some things that I'm telling you are for you, guiding light. Here's what I mean by this, that you have been hearing the word. Jesus made this statement. He said that the secrets of the kingdom are given to his disciples. How have I defined you as what type of church? A discipling church, which means there are certain things, guiding light, that as you listen to what I reveal to you, God's going to reveal even more to you because you're not just church members. You are disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is a student. You are students of God. I am giving you more words than an average pastor will give you in six months. You are learning. You're disciples. Therefore, God is going to give you revelation. When I told you to go read last week, I meant for Holy Spirit to be speaking to you. And if you read, Holy Spirit was saying something. I don't know whether you heard it or not. But if you keep listening, he will begin to reveal to you things other people don't see. Because as you hold to his word, as Jesus said, you, in, you abide in my word. If you stay and hold to it, keep holding on, he said, then you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. You don't read God's word just one time and think you get something out of it. 
understanding very clearly. There are levels of understanding of God's word. There's the simple level, just reading the story. But then there's a deeper level that comes, the second level. Theologians talk about it, especially rabbis. But then there's a third level. It's a hidden level. You are going to be privy to the hidden level because of what God has given to me. And when I say hidden, it's just stuff that's not on the surface. It's stuff that you just don't turn over a rock and get. It's stuff you got to dig down deep. And that stuff that you dig down deep, once I begin to show you how to do it, it is my expectation that every one of you all will begin applying the word of God in a different way. I will show you the simplicity of the story, and then I'm going to reveal another level and then another level. So this is not just a one Sunday message. We're going to find out a lot more. Here's what God says in Proverbs 25 and 2. He says, it is the glory of God to conceal the matter, to the glory of God to conceal it. Because when you find out what God has done, oh, I'm telling you, when you begin to see it, it begins to change your life. He says this, but the glory of kings is to what? Search out a matter. In other words, God has hidden things, as Jesus said, from the masses but the disciples were seeing. And why will the disciples see it? Because the disciples are a royal priesthood. They are a holy nation. If you are a royal priesthood, then you are a son of God. You are a child of the king. It is to the glory of kings, which is you, to search it out. You've got to do more than just listen to bishop preach. You've got to get along with God in your closet and hear what Bishop preached and then look it over and say, God, now teach me more. It's not enough to just come to church and hear a preacher give you what he's got. God is no respect of persons. What I've got, you can get. And you are a witness for Christ. You have a light that he wants to shine. You are somebody because God has touched your life. But you're going to see the tactics that the devil is going to use to keep you from becoming all God wants you to be. And those are things we're going to talk about a little bit right now. And we'll go through a few of them, but it's just the beginning of things that we're going to see. So last week I gave you a few words of how Satan uses tactics against us. The first of those tactics you're going to see was distraction. Satan always tries to get you away from looking at God. He'll get you to look at Bishop. He'll get you to look at him and see a flaw in Bishop and say, well, see, I ain't listening to him because anybody that's going to wear a yellow tie and a yellow shirt, something wrong with them. He will distract you with everything he can. He will have the brothers distract you. He will have the sisters distract you. Simple thing I've always said ever since I've been in ministry, he will have a fly distract you. The devil will have, because he is Lord of flies, he will have flies flying around the room. And when the preaching and the word is going forth, you'll watch that fly. I wonder where that fly is going. And then you'll see the fly laying on somebody. You'll start thinking about, why is that fly laying on them? They must be nasty. There's <laughs> something wrong with them that that fly on them. And you will miss all the word, but the devil works with distraction. He got Eve distracted by saying, has God indeed said? In other words, what was God saying? God said something else. He distracted her. He actually distracted her by coming in the form of a serpent. But we'll see that later on. And then what the next thing Satan does, he wants to distract you from the word, and then he wants to cause deception. Deception is to deceive you about what God said. For instance, I hate to do it, but I got to go there. In Sodom and Gomorrah, there's a deception that says the reason why the city was destroyed is because it was not a city of hospitality. It didn't welcome the stranger, and so it was destroyed. Looking all over the fact that the men in the city wanted to have sex with the other men that came in the city. To change God's word, deception, that is the second thing he will do. He will deceive you of what God said. 
distract you, and then deceive you by saying, that ain't what God meant. Did God really say, don't eat of any tree in the garden? He will deceive you. And then when he causes deception, the next thing he does, he brings about doubt. Well, I wonder if what God said was right. You know, a lot of folk wrote the Bible. They probably changed and put some stuff in there that they didn't want in there. You know, maybe what they wanted. You know, King James wrote the Bible. I went through these processes too. When I got distracted, you remember in the very beginning when I told you how I was led to the Lord in my Southern Baptist college, and I was led to the Lord by a whole lot of folk that told me about Jesus and little white girls say, I want to date you. And I said, what did she say? What did your parents say? They say, can't date you because you a black man. And that was a deception to cause me to begin to turn away from God because of the distraction and the deception. The deception that God's word say a black man and a white woman shouldn't get together. That was a deception. Because you see, in God's eyesight, there is no black, there is no white. In God's eyesight, you're either saved or you're lost. But I was deceived because I was, I was distracted by the white girl, distracted by what her mom and daddy said, and then deceived to believe that the word of God said blacks and whites should not be together. And then I began doubting all of God's word. Because how could a God be like this? The tricks of the devil are the same. You're going to see. And then you're going to find out how he caused doubt with Eve and with Adam. Then when you get doubt, the next thing that happens is discontent. Doubt gets in there. You start then complaining about what you got. Oh, I don't, you know, I'm tired of this. I mean, this, this can't be what it's supposed to be. Watch this. Here's the distraction. You get up here and, and, and somebody distracts you from the word. And then you get deceived, thinking ain't no word going here. Or the distraction is it's another church. And you get deceived into thinking, well, it's better word over there than it is over here. And then you start thinking that. Then doubt gets in your mind. I heard Bishop, but you know, I don't know. Oh, the guy over here does like this. It's not. Then you get, you get discontented. And discontented is, I don't know, it just ain't like it used to be. This don't feel like it used to be. Now you got discontent. Then after a while, after discontent, as it was with what, what the devil did with Eve, he said, because God knows in the day that you eat of it, then you're going to be like God. And what, God withholding something from me? I don't like that. She was discontented with God. And then the next thing is you deny God's word. And that's when you begin to say, and you can hear the word of God going forth. He don't know what he's talking about. You begin to deny I began to deny God when I got turned away because I was distracted by the girl. And then deception, the word of God, say black people, white people can't do. I had doubt in my mind, is the word right? Now I'm discontented with the gospel. I started studying Islam. And I began denying God. And then after you get into denial, the next thing happens is you dishonor. You begin in your mind to say, well, God ain't all that. Maybe God is this. Maybe God is that. You begin to dishonor him. You don't come to church like you used to. You don't study your Bible. You begin to dishonor him because you're denying that it's actually God's word because you're discontent with what stuff is going on because you're beginning to doubt it now because you've been deceived by the devil and you've been distracted by something that got you going in the first place. You see, I went back up. All right, now, then when you dishonor, you dishonor God, then the next thing you do is you become disobedient. And when you're disobedient like Adam and Eve did, they ate of the tree. That was disobedience. They dishonored God by the thoughts in their mind, and then their actions caused them to disobey what God said. And there was an eighth thing God gave me this morning, but it's an action by God. When you have followed Satan's seven steps, you have reached the fullness of what Satan can do. And after Satan has done all that he can do to you, God can no longer hold on to you. God must dismiss you. You find at the end of the chapter 3, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. Why? Go with me very quickly. One, they were distracted. Two, they were deceived by the devil. Three, they began to doubt God's word. Four, they got discontented with what was going on. And they say, well, God's withholding from us. Five, they got in denial that God said we will die. Maybe we won't die because the devil said. 
through his deception, you will not die. Six, then they began to dishonor God. And after they dishonored God, they dishonored God in their thought. I shall not surely die. God's word is not true. Therefore, then their disobedience went against God, which finally led to their dismissal by God. And notice there were seven items, but the eighth item was disobedience. I mean dismissal. And dismissal means a new beginning. A new beginning for those of you who have gone through the seven steps and you'll finally be dismissed and you'll have a new beginning in hell. So, let us go a little bit more and understand after Adam and Eve had done those things, and I'll show you some things about what happened. She took of the tree and she, she took of the tree, it says, and ate. I like the pause when I get to the point because God has shown me how to pause in that verse, which it has to be there. And, and, and well, let's just do that for a moment. That is, uh, verse, not verse four. Go to verse, go to verse six for a minute. I want to go to verse six, Genesis three six, and look at this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now I want to show you. Now, see, Satan has completed his his seven steps, his tactics against her. And what we're going to look at right here is that the woman saw that the tree was good for, now this is the way the devil's going to come at you. It was good for what? Good for what? And food is good for what? The body. Satan started distracting her from what God said. Think about what your body needs. Whoa. Many of us give thought to what our body needs. That's why Jesus told us, don't worry about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat. Just seek the kingdom of God. Because you see, those things will distract you from the word of God. She saw that it was good for food that was for the body, that it was pleasant to the eyes. And I want you to know, pleasant to the eyes, that's her emotions. It looked good. So Satan now is working on her body thoughts. Get her in the body. You're going to get some good food. And it, then she says, pleasant to the eyes, that's her soul. See, what I'm getting you see is now you go through those seven steps of what Satan's going to do. Then he begins to work on your mind to think about what's good for your flesh. And then he appeals to your soul. See, he's out to get you and to your soul. And where's that's her the soul, which is the center of your, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your intellect. And so her emotions told her that's a pleasant fruit. And then he gets you to focus on the physical thing, which is the third thing. She said, and a tree desirable for making one wise. Wise for what? Not wise on spiritual things, but wise on things of the world. After all, the tree is planted in the world. The wisdom that will come from that tree is wisdom not of the heavens, but wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the heavens came from God. There was a choice. God's wisdom or earthly wisdom. Today, there's a choice. God's wisdom or earthly wisdom. Many of us will be put to shame when we stand before God because we spent more time studying for worldly wisdom than we have for godly wisdom. We all have gone pretty much to school for 12 years to learn how to do well in this world. But how diligent have we studied the word of God? When we stand before God, God says, do you love me? He asked Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? He's going to ask us, do we love him? And then when he begins to declare to us, you spent 12 years in school learning a natural education. But when you came to church, you were still texting your boyfriend, a girlfriend. You set up in there and you were focused on other reasons for being at church. But yet you gave 12 years to the world. How much did you give to me? See, God will look at all of us and say, do you love me? Do you love me enough that when you come to church, your focus is on me, not on Bishop, on me. What did Bishop say that turns you to me? And if you get upset with Bishop, don't let him block you from me. Because if Bishop stands in the way of you and me, then he stands closer to me than you do. So you have to understand Satan is going to work on you to get you distracted so that you will not focus on the things that God wants you to do. 
And then we'll see the consequences of what happened when, when she went all the way from distraction down to her disobedience. And then she started focusing on her body. Good for food. I'm going to get wise. And she says, and then also, it, it, it's good. Look how pretty that thing is. That's what she's going to say. And she says, she also, she says, she took of the fruit and ate. But you see, you're going to find out something. I'm going to show you that word. When the Lord told me, she took of its fruit. And the conjunction and ate says to me, they are two different actions. She took of the fruit and ate. Why did she do it? I'm going to show y'all something else before I do the whole story, because that's where I'm led to go right now. Genesis 3 and 1. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? We'll deal with that wording in just a few moments. But watch what she says in the next moment. She says, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, which is in the midst of the garden, she says, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. That's why I like to say, and when she saw that it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom, verse 6, she took, and then she ate. Let me show you what screwed up Eve. God never said, don't touch the thing. God said, let's go up there and look what God said. Then I'll get back. I think your mind can be able to hold on to this particular stuff I'm fixing to tell you right now. Genesis 2.15. Hold on, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. Watch. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Next verse. And he says, and the Lord God commanded, not ask, not wished of the man, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. Notice he's giving him everything. And the devil says, of all the trees in the garden that God say you shall not eat. And see, the devil flips the script on what God said. And go on to the next. He said, of every tree you may freely eat. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Question for you. Did he say anything about not touching it? Let me show you how Eve messed up. Let's go back to the verse where Eve tells Satan, verse 2 and verse 3. Look at what she said, verse 2 and verse 3. And the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3, she says, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it. She added something. So that in verse 6, go down there. When she sees now that it appeals to her body, it appears, ap appeals to her soul, and it appeals to the natural thing, the Bible says she took. But God, I didn't die. Now the devil begins to create the doubt because she added to the word of God when the word of God tells us don't add, don't subtract, you got to be precise. Don't turn to the left or to the right. She added to the word of God, and that little addition of don't touch lest you die, the fact that she touched and she did not die now causes her to think, if I can touch and don't die, I can eat and don't die. And notice the next part of it. And she gave to her husband who said, chick's still alive. Oh, my God. She gave to her husband who did not die. She wasn't dead. Through distraction, Satan now gets the man to take. And what was he distracted? Oh, he was distracted because the woman was still there. And she did it. Oh, you can't do nothing. I can't do. And he ate. And 
And then you'll find that the eyes of both of them were open. Well, we might as well read that. The eyes of them were open. Now, let me tell you something. That ain't these eyes. How do I know it's not these eyes? It said the eyes of them were open. And it says, and they, they knew they were naked. Now, God, dog it, they've been walking around naked all the time. Their eyes been open. Do you think that because they, their eyes were closed when they were walking around in the garden? They didn't know they were naked? No, they had their eyes open. The eyes had nothing to do with the eyes. This is something for you to understand that it is Scripture telling you that this is the conscious of Adam and Eve came alive. Now they are conscious after eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They are conscious of good and evil. And when their eyes are open, it doesn't mean these. It means their consciousness said, go you naked. And so are you, dude. Conscious comes into play. A consciousness of right and wrong. Same thing that's with us today. You may not have read the scripture of something that's wrong, but something inside of you, when something's done wrong, it just don't sit right with my spirit. Your conscious will tell you. So here's revelation that we see things right here that been before our eyes all along. But because we never looked with eyes of the spirit to see things as they are, now see them as they are, we don't recognize how God is doing things. So, I wanted to give you revelation of some of this stuff. One of the other things, he told them, and this is a story I was telling someone just the other day when God gave me the revelation. In the garden, how many trees were of importance? There were all those trees that were there, but how many trees were in the midst of the garden? Two. What were the two? Tree of the knowledge and a tree of life. There are still two trees. But let me tell you how Satan screwed stuff up. I wanted to tell this story one day about the tale of two trees. First tree was planted in the garden by God. Now listen and see who can get it. If you were at the first service, don't cheat. Let everybody else figure it out for themselves. The second tree was planted in a garden by man. The first tree was pleasant to the eyes, and the woman and the man ate of it. But the second tree was hideous and repellent. They didn't see any beauty in the fruit of that second tree that anybody should desire to want to eat it. The first tree, God commanded us, do not eat of the tree. I guess I need two trees. I can't get two trees. Two trees. First tree, God said, don't eat of that tree. The second tree, God said, freely eat. The first tree, you eat of it, it brings sin and condemnation and death. The second tree, you eat of its fruit, and it brings life. It brings eternal life and freedom. Has anybody figured out the second tree yet? What you think? I will give you more details since no one seems to have that as of yet. The first tree brought sin and death. The second tree, when you eat of its fruit, it cleanses you of all sin and brings eternal life. One person said it. You have said what the fruit was, but I want to know what the name of the tree was. The cross. The second tree, God planted the first tree. Man planted the second tree, but God put the fruit on the tree. And to all that eat of the fruit of the second tree, he has called you to freely eat of my body and drink of my blood. The first tree he commanded you, do not eat. Second tree, he encourages you. Satan works to keep you 
eating from the first tree and, re and, and he wants you to eat from the first tree but causes you to turn from the second tree. And what you have to open up your eyes is that through distraction, he moves you from the cross to keep you to the tree of the world so that your focus is on the fruits of the world and not fruits of God. There are several other things we can look at about the tree. The first tree was eaten of by man and he was cast out of paradise. The second tree... When a man ate of it, by faith, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day, you will be with me. Where? Cast out of paradise? No, you will be brought into paradise. You see, the two trees are the two trees that God has given us to make a choice from. You can choose to continue to go after the knowledge of the world or you can choose to go after the fruit of the tree of life that is Jesus Christ planted by man. But at this tree, Satan has made it so repugnant that you don't want to look at it. But that's the tree of life. See, Satan does opposite. Here's a tree that's pleasant. Eat this. A lot of stuff look good. But in the end, you pay for it with your life. This looks like something. This can't be the right way because God's ways are not our ways. He goes a completely different way. Both trees were a knowledge of good and evil. See, knowledge of the world, good and evil, and knowledge of the word, good and evil. When you eat of this tree of the world, this knowledge changes. Once upon a time, it was wrong for two men to get married. But today, it's okay. This tree over here said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. This tree says, did God really say it has to be that way? As long as you love, distraction, it's on love. Not on truth. It's distraction. How do you feel? Not what are the facts. See, truth is relevant over here. Truth is solid right here. And you have to decide. Life gives you a choice between the two trees. They're still there. The tree of life. It's the tree that is the one that's repugnant to us. It's the tree of the cross. But the fruit that you eat of it, that fruit, when you eat of it, it changes your life. Now you are no longer the same. You have been changed. You are a new creation, not one born under the tree of death. But now you are under the tree of life. You have been changed. You no longer abound by the same restrictions that you were bound under with the first tree. Now you have the second tree, and the second tree is the one that causes you to rejoice in every day. Though I might seem like I might be withering away, understand that God works on the inside towards the outside. But let me make another point to prove the point. Let's go back. We talk about the trees. Let's go back to what Satan did to the woman in verse 6. Watch how he works. He said, the woman saw the tree was good for food, for the body. It was pleasant to the eyes, my soul, my emotions. A tree desirable to make one wise, what? Wise in the world. So that's the physical. Notice how Satan works this way. He works from the outside to get in. But God works a different way. God said, I'll give you a new spirit. He works from the inside to the outside. There are different ways that you shall see. And remember that Satan's method never changes. Let's go with this issue for a moment so we may understand it. All right, when Satan came to Jesus, what does it say in Matthew, the fourth chapter? It says, he came to him in order to tempt him. Let's find out how Satan, and I'm going through the notes so I can find this real quick. So you got to do it by my 
Well, as Satan tempted him, he said in Matthew 4 and 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, who well, commanded these stones become bread. Why? So you need them. Why? So that your body be satisfied. Next thing, Matthew 4 or 5. Then the devil took him on a holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, doubt, trying to cause doubt, throw yourself down. For it's written, he shall give the angel charge over you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up. He's going after his logical thinking process. He's going after his soul. Working from the outside in. Again, the devil took him up on it. This is Matthew 4 and 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give you if you fall down and what? Worship. Worship is of the spirit. Satan is working from the outside in. He works the same way on all of us. I ain't never been struck with the spirit, the fine spirit of a woman, but I've been struck with the fine body of a woman working from the outside in. And when that happens, I need to know when the temptation comes, she ain't nothing but a distraction trying to lead me to my dismissal from the place that I have with God. You understand what I'm talking about? That sister's on the flip side of it. I mean, you know, maybe you don't find no handsome looking man, but let him have a nice car and a nice house. It seems like when men look like they got some money, they start looking a whole lot better. That's a distraction. Because my father is rich in houses and land. He holds the wealth of the world in the palm of his hand. You don't need no man to distract you from the riches God got for you. 